The Baba Ghoulie Show is brought to you by OTR Halloween Holidays. <laughs> Quiet, please. The American Broadcasting Company presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, please, for today is called Northern Lights. This is a story about the temporal displacement of mass. It is also a story about teleportation. Do you know what those terms mean? No, I didn't think you did, but you stay right where you are, my charming friend, and you're quite likely to find out. You just stay right there and listen. I'll tell you everything you want to know. And maybe... Well, maybe a couple of things you're not terribly anxious to know. Ever see the Northern Lights? Aurora Borealis is their right name. You don't see them very often below the 50th parallel of latitude in this country, but up in northern Minnesota and Canada, upper New York, places like that, they're quite common of a winter night. If you've seen them, you know what they look like. If you haven't, there's no use by trying to describe them. Sometimes they fill a whole northern sky with waves of color, like a fire burning way beyond the horizon. Sometimes they're just long streamers of fire filling up the whole sky. And another time they look like gigantic, fringed curtains of pure light, swaying as if some cold cosmic breeze plucked at them, way far off there to the north. And you can hear them, too, sometimes. Well, maybe not exactly hear them, but... But there's a sound, a humming, a... A crackling somewhere inside your head. And there are times when you'd swear it's a voice talking to you. Talking in some kind of strange language you can almost understand. Filling your whole being with a kind of... Desperate, inescapable terror. You know what I mean? At night, in the cold night, voices talking and saying things to you that you can almost understand, filling the night sky with signs and portents of of inescapable terror. And nobody, nobody in the whole world knows what they are, nobody in this world at least, except me. And after I get done talking to you, you'll know too. And you won't be happy. Let me show you something now. This is from a recording I made on, uh, let's see, December 13th, 1948, a little more than a month and a half ago. I started the recorder while Norman and I were just about finished with our work that afternoon here in the laboratory. I just set the microphone on top of the file cabinet there and turned on the machine. Listen, I'm going to play it back for you. The quality isn't so very good, but you can recognize my voice and, and Norman's, I think. Here. Well, I got the call. Rewound now, I guess. Did you test it? How can I test it when I say I just got to rewound? Well, hurry up. It's almost six o'clock. Yeah. Well, it's dark, but I didn't realize the time. Hurry up. I'm hurrying. Um, be a display tonight, you suppose? How do I know? Been a display the last three nights. Well, that was a dinger last night, wasn't it? Yeah, the machine wasn't ready. Hey, listen, now, do you think you can do better than I can? Ouch! What's the matter? Oh, I stuck my finger. Where'd you... Where'd you put the copper sulfate? Um, oh, uh, up above the sink. Huh? Uh, I got it. What are you doing? Testing the coil. How's it? Oh, it looks okay. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, it's okay. I'll 
be right with you. Uh, hook it up. What are you going to send? Uh, try my cigarette lighter. That won't work anyway. I'll, I won't miss it if we don't get it back. Now, I don't know how the thing will work when the northern lights aren't shining. Well, maybe they are shining. Turn off the room lights. Let's see. All right. Pretty early, I hear. Uh, What's the matter? Hey, look. Ooh, out early tonight. Oh, boy, that's fine. The whole sky. Look, blue and yellow. See, I, I never saw those long fringes. Before. Never the same. Oh, say, did you turn on the recorder? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's turning over. Let's see. <clears throat> now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their party. Now leave it alone. Uh, you about ready now? Well, it's funny about the aurora. Northern lights? Listen to this well, part closely, friend. Oh, I don't know. Remember what I told you. You, you can almost hear the darn things. Uh, not hear them, I mean, but it's uh, it's kind of like somebody talking to you in a language you can you can almost understand. I don't know. I mean, you ever notice it? Sure. High frequencies, I guess. Something. Awful lot we don't understand. Look, uh, you go there at the recorder and talk into the mic. Talk what? Well, just describe what happens for the record. I know I'm not uh, here. I know you're not, but just say what you see so we'll have an accurate record. Okay. Now? Go ahead. <clears throat> this is an experiment in the temporal displacement of a solid object. Uh, in other words, the first actual demonstration of a time machine. If it works. It'll work all right. Go on. Paul is now placing his old beat-up cigarette lighter on the stage of the hypercube candelator, and he is now setting the microchronometer to determine how far into the future he's going to send the lighter. Well, how far, Paul? Uh, ten seconds. Ten seconds. Now, at, at the end of that time, if our calculations are correct, and we hope they are, the cigarette lighter will reappear. In that period of time, it will have been into the future. Um, we could send it farther into the future if we wanted to, I guess, but we'd just have to wait that much longer for time to catch up with it and make it reappear. But ten seconds, well, I mean, uh, we can prove our point by sending it 10 seconds into the future, just as well as 10 years ahead, and this way we don't have to wait so long. Hey, how am I doing, Paul? I go into your commercial. When Paul presses the little button, the cigarette lighter will turn to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not right. It'll be here, but it'll be 10 now, seconds. Now, listen away. closely, please. Yeah. Well, now, What's um, going to happen? Mr. Paul McGilligot, a famous mad scientist, is about to press the big old button and send his lighter into the future. Ready, Paul? Here we go. Stand by. Look! Gone! By golly, it is gone. It just disappeared. Bang, like that. Hold your watch up close to the mic, Paul. So it'll record. Yeah. Um, the, 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 there isn't a sign of the lighter. Uh, the little stage on which Paul placed it is empty, and it should uh, appear again in, in just a second if it really did work. Three, two, one. It's back! It's back, Norm! It worked! We made it! Oh, man, let's, let's see if it's all right. Oh, Jesus. Oh, now what? Oh, the lighter. Oh, oh it's cold, Paul. Oh, here, here, here. Take it, take it, Paul. Take it. It's oh, freezing cold. What do you know? The, the darn thing's like a piece of ice. Now, where the dickens do you suppose it's been in that ten seconds? No, wait, friend. You know, it, That's it not right. the payoff yet. Said, oh, only in the future. Listen. And time's caught up with it. It's, it's back, but... Hey, Paul, look. Where did that come from? What? There on the stage where the lighter was. Where'd that come from? In the middle of winter. What is it? It's a caterpillar, Paul. A brown and black caterpillar. Where do you suppose it came from? It wasn't there. Was I'll, I'll tell you where it came from, Paul. What? It came from the same place where the cigarette lighter went. What are you talking about? Well, feel it, Paul. Feel its fur. See? It's as cold as ice, too. A caterpillar. A little brown and black caterpillar, the kind they call woolly bears. You know, larva of the tiger moth, the icy Isabella. In the dead of winter and as cold as ice. Where did it come from? Huh? You want to know. Incidentally, you know, the old-timers say that the 
Wooly bear caterpillar is a weather prophet. If the brown bands on his fur are narrow, there's a severe winter ahead. If they're wide, it's going to be a mild winter. Yeah, maybe. This one, you could hardly see the brown bands. Tough weather ahead, that's what the old timers would say. But where'd she come from? She wasn't there when we put the cigarette lighter on the stage. When time caught up again, there she was. She? Sure, Isabella. I see her, Isabella. I told you, remember? Well, she was wiggling happily when she arrived from somewhere in the future. But as she warmed up, she seemed to go into a trance, almost a, a death-like trance. So Norman said, put her in the deep freeze. Maybe she'll come to again in the cold. So we put her in the deep freeze. And in half an hour when we looked in at her, she was wiggling happily. At ten degrees below zero, Fred. Now, can you tie that? My goodness, she should have been frozen solid. Well, nothing special happened for a couple of days. That, you remember, was a month and a half ago, December 13th, 1948. Where were you on the night of December 18th? Or Saturday night, a week before Christmas. I'd been Christmas shopping in the afternoon, I remember. I came back to the laboratory to check up on some stuff. And Norman was there, fiddling with things. Hi, Norm, I said. How's Isabella? You know something funny, Paul? What's the matter with you? Who, me? You look so pale. You sick? Eat something disagreed with you? Paul, Isabella's singing. Singing what? Uh, Isabella's singing? <laughs> You're dotty. She's singing. The caterpillar's singing. Not tap dancing, I hope. I'm not kidding you. Oh, cut it out. Open the deep freeze and listen. You've been at the C2H50H? I haven't had a drink since Thursday night. Well, now, what? Open you... the deep freeze and listen. No kidding? No kidding. Well, we, we don't know where she came from. I won't be surprised at anything. Hello, Isabella. Hey, don't do that. What's the matter? Afraid she'll have to be back? Well, I don't know what. <laughs> Hello, Isabella. <laughs> I hear you singing. I told you. Paul. I don't hear anything. Now, listen, Paul. I haven't lost my buttons. I've been hearing it all afternoon. I couldn't figure out what was doing it, and then I noticed it was louder alongside the deep freeze here. So I opened it up and stuck my head inside, and it was coming from her. Yeah. Uh, what does it sound like, Norm? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like... Uh, a E I A E I? Didn't she say A E I O U and sometimes W and Y? Now don't rib me. I tell you, I heard it. <laughs> I think you better take a Christmas vacation, Norm. I'm not no, mad. I know, kid. I know. But listen, we've been playing around with some pretty deep cosmic secrets, you and me. We've managed temporal displacement, which nobody in the world has ever done, see? Uh, maybe we both need a rest. You know what I think, Paul? What? I think we've managed teleportation, too. And we don't know it. Teleportation? You mean like Charles Ford talks about? I mean transporting tangible objects from one place to another without any mechanical means. Electronically? I don't know, Paul. All I know is that that cigarette lighter was someplace where it was awful cold. And it wasn't cold here in this room. Well... And where did that caterpillar come from? Oh, I don't know. It came from wherever that cigarette lighter went, Paul. But where? I don't know. Somewhere. And you know what? I'm going to find out where it came from. You are? And how, may I ask you? I'm going to modify this gadget of ours, this hypercucambulator, so it'll carry a man. And then, my dear boss, I'm going to sit down in it and have you send me out there somewhere in time and space and come back and tell you all about it. That's all for tonight, bud. What? Come on, I'll take you out and buy you a drink. I'm not fooling, Paul. Okay, okay, you're not fooling, Norm. Get your hat and coat and come on. <laughs> I prescribe hot buttered rum. Well... Turn off the lights. Will you listen to me for Turn a Turn off the lights. I want hot buttered rum. Okay, okay. Gosh, look out of that window. The northern lights. Oh, they're really bright tonight. They sure are. Look how they pulse. Up, down. Up, down. Norm. Up, what? Look at the deep freeze there in the dark. What about? You see it? Light, Paul. Light. It's a... It... I see it, Norm. It's right in step with the northern lights. And the same color. Red, 
red. Blue, blue. Up, down. Up, Coming down. from the deep freeze where our little friend down. Isabella was singing to you. Now, what hey, do you... Paul, listen. I don't let me. endlessly repeating A-E-I-O-U, the vowel sounds of our speech, and watching the light that pulsed up from the deep freeze in perfect rhythm with the flickering of the northern lights we watched through the window. And we thought long, long thoughts that I, well, I don't remember any too clearly now. I do know we both of us thought of ways to perfect our little mechanism, our time machine. Our machine that brought back a little cold brown and black caterpillar from somewhere. And when it was morning, and the lights had faded from the northern skies, we found that our machine was very different. The stage where we found the caterpillar was larger now. I had only a vague recollection of what had happened in the night. I said to Norm, Norman, I said, what did we do last night? I don't know for sure, Paul. Did we rebuild that thing? Make it larger? I don't know. I... It seemed... Well, I, I mean, I think I dreamed I was working on it. I think I hit my finger with a hammer. Yeah, I see. Hmm. Huh. Thumb's all bruised. Certainly looks it. Well, nobody could have gotten in here. The door's locked. The machine's certainly different. This coil, I think. Look. It's rewound it. Did I do that? My head hurts. Yeah, mine too. Oh, I don't get it. I don't either. I wish I could. Listen, Norm. What? Maybe we did change it. But I... Well, how could we have done all that by ourselves? I got an idea. What? Why, maybe... Isabella helped us. The caterpillar? Oh, Let's you're... see, shall we? Open the deep freeze. Well, I opened it. It was empty. There wasn't any brown and black caterpillar in the deep freeze. We took a flashlight and looked over every inch of it. We stood there and looked at each other. For a whole minute. Foreman said, well. I just shook my head. And we went over and sat down. All of a sudden I said, I found her, Norman. And there she was. There was little... Isabella, the caterpillar, crumpled up stone dead on the floor of the laboratory. Now, you know, caterpillars have little tiny paws. And one of Isabella's paws was the end of a long piece of wire that ran up to the generator coil. Well, how did she get out? And I said the thing couldn't be opened from the inside. I said it was fastened down tight when I took the lid off just now. But she did get out. Maybe. Maybe she did help us, Norm, I said. And he just sat there and stared at me. And I got up and put on my overcoat. Where are you going? Where are you going, Paul? I said, I'm going to find out something, Norman. Where I'm going, it's cold, I said. I know that, and I'm going to find out what's been going on and where that caterpillar came from. Norm goggled at me. I stepped on the stage of the machine which was to take me away somewhere in time and space. I said, Norm, turn it on. over and touched the switch. He didn't say a word. And I braced myself. I nodded at him. Go ahead, I said. And he pressed the switch. And nothing happened at all. Nothing. Why? I know, Paul, I know. It's daylight. And there aren't any northern lights. Well, it was just as well. 
So I had a chance to think about it a little, and I realized that just an overcoat wouldn't do me any good where I might be going. And so when it was dark night again and the northern lights were flickering and dancing in the sky, I put on a high-altitude aviator suit that had its own source of heat supply. Norman shook his head as I got back on the stage. I nodded for him to press the switch. Cold. You've never been cold, friend. Dark. You wouldn't know how dark it can get. And then I was standing on an immense plain that stretched so far, so far into the distance, a plain of snow and eternal ice. A dead, cold, white world with the blackest sky above me. And the northern lights reached from horizon to horizon. Even through the high-altitude suit, I could feel a biting cold. And I was afraid. Shivering, abjectly afraid. The streamers of the northern lights reached down toward me and wrapped about me. I heard the sound of voices screaming into my mind. I, I could understand them. I wished hardly I'd never played around with cosmic forces. I yelled inside the heavy helmet. I yelled, Norman! Norman, bring me back! And there was nobody to hear me. No, I don't know where I was. Another planet? Maybe the North Pole? Maybe the lights were all around me. Maybe that's where it was, but... You know, it was the most terrible, awful, cold, lonely place you could imagine in a hundred years. The lights, the flickering... Living lights crawled over me and beat at me. I could almost understand what they were saying. And then, the crash. The sudden blackness. I was standing again in the laboratory. I'd left only a few short seconds ago, and Norman was tearing at the fastenings of my suit and beating at me with both hands. I wondered what in the world he was doing until I got the helmet off. He was brushing caterpillars off me. Thousands of cold... Freezing cold, brown and black, Isabella Caterpillar. I was in bed for a week or more. I don't know how long. Wherever it was I'd been, I'd nearly frozen to death in those short seconds. And at last, I was able to come back to the laboratory. I sat there that night with Norman. And outside the windows, the northern lights were brighter than they'd ever been before. Purple, green, yellow. Black lights, even. And there was a new rhythm tonight. A kind of code. Almost words. Thoughts. Not quite formed, and yet curiously disturbing. Norman, though, didn't seem to be as disturbed as I was. He just sat quietly and looked at me. Where did those caterpillars come from, Paul? I don't know. Where I was, that's all I know. Did you... Did they attack you, or...? I don't know. They came from the lights. The lights? The northern lights. Where are they, Norman? The caterpillars? Yes. Where are they? In the deep freeze. Where Isabella was. Poor Isabella. What's the matter with you, Paul? I'm listening. Listening to what? Don't you hear them? I don't hear anything. Don't you? I don't hear anything. Well, listen. Listen. I don't hear anything. Turn on the recording machine. I want to see if we could pick up their voices. There isn't anything. Turn it on. Turn it on. I want a recording. Quick. Quick, Norman. They're talking to us. Listen, friend, I want to play you another recording. This is what came out of our tape recorder that night when I was listening to the voices. And Norman couldn't hear anything. Just listen. I still don't hear anything, Paul. Be still, listen. I tell you, I... Listen. What's that? Look at the deep freeze. The top's coming open. Look at the light around it, Paul. Be quiet. Watch. How did they... Good Lord, look. The caterpillars are coming out, Paul. Look at them. There's millions of them. Be still, Norman. But, but, but Paul, you, your voice... Be still, I said. What's the matter with your voice? 
We want to talk to you. You what? You, you said we. Why, of course, Norman. We. Who for the... It is Paul's voice, Norman. Paul's voice. Voice. But it is not Paul speaking. Listen. We speak to you. Paul! Not Paul. We, the people of the lights. We from the cold. We are speaking to you with Paul's voice. I tell you that... Paul's voice will tell you what to do when the time comes, Norman. We go to the machine now. Paul's mind is ours for a little time now. We go to the machine. The machine that brought us to your world from the world of the lights. Who are you? Who? The people of the lights. To take over this world of yours. Only this world of yours is so hot. We must have the cold world. And we know how to make it cold. What's the matter, Paul? Paul! So, so hot. No, no. Quick, Norman. Turn on the machine. Send us to places in your world. No, our world. Hurry. So hot. Hurry, so hot. Paul! Hurry. Hurry. Turn on the machine. <laughs> That's the end of the recording. No, I don't know. I don't have any recollection of it at all. But the recording's there, isn't it? That must be what happened. Anyway, when I woke up, Norman was gone, and there were no caterpillars in the place here. And our machine, our machine that took people and things away into time and space, was wrecked. I don't know what became of it. You heard what they said about my voice. They're going to take over this world and make it a cold world, like the one they came from. Wherever that is, and wherever they went. No, I don't know where they went, where the machine sent them. I do have ideas. Yes. Are you cold? It's freezing in here. And just for example, uh, you read the papers? Look at the newsreels. Did you see the pictures of the snow in Los Angeles? In subtropical Los Angeles, where it hasn't snowed for so many, many years? I wondered about it, too. I wonder if anybody saw any brown and black woolly bear caterpillars in Los Angeles. Larva of the tiger moth I see, Isabella. The title of today's Quiet Please story is Northern Lights. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And my laboratory assistant, Norman, was played by Dan Sutter. The voices of Isabella and her friends was that of Cecil Roy. As usual, music for Quiet Please is played by Albert Berman. Now for a word about next week. Our writer, director, my good friend, Willis Cooper. Thank you for listening to Quiet, Please. For next week, I have a story for you that comes from the steel mills out South Chicago way. It's called Tap the Heat, Bogdan. <laughs> and so, until next week at this same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. Now, a listening reminder. How are your predictions of things to come? What's your batting average? Compare your average with the man who has made predicting his business. Listen to Drew Pearson tonight on ABC. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. It's intermission time at the Baba Gully Show. Time to refresh yourself and visit our snack bar. Got a yen for some hot popcorn? As about your favorite soft drinks, which are sparkling cold. 
and there's all kinds of candy to tempt you. It's radio time, folks. Enjoy the rest of the program. During the intermission, our radio show brings to you a cartoon for the record. I'll return you to our radio show. Hope you're enjoying today's radio program. When it's done, be sure to check out our channel over at WatchWatch. Enjoy some tunes with a nice cold soda. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? She dark. Still unconscious, Cheryl. Let's see if this statement of yours is right. I started for New York at a quarter of nine tonight. I was about halfway from my farm to the main road to Wardsley when I saw a young woman lying in the middle of the road, face down. 
with a black purse lying beside her. Yes, sir. Black purse beside her. I picked her up, put her in the car, and brought her here to the sheriff's office. I never saw her before. That's right. Sign it here, please. Yeah, ain't any chance of a mistake. That's her, all right. You say you picked her up at the station? Yeah, this afternoon. She got a 420 from New York. She wanted to be taken over to Carruthers' old place. When I told her Carruthers had been dead a long time, you'd have thought I'd slapped her face. And she asked who lived in the house. I told her no one did. Well, she wanted to go over there right away, so I took her. She have any baggage? Nothing but a hand grip. She talk any on the way out? Didn't open her mouth once. Okay, thanks. Sure, Sheriff. Night, Doc. Good night. I wonder what became of her grip. Come along, Doc. We're going over to Crowther's house. All right. Oh, uh, Henderson. Yes? Tell the night nurse to go in with the girl. I'll be back in a little while. All right, Doc. Sir. Dr. Elliot wishes to see you. He's waiting in the library. Elliot? Who's he? The town doctor, sir. I'll be right in. Excuse me, darling. I'm worried, doctor. There's been very little change in her condition since she was picked up last night. Now, as I understand you're a New York psychiatrist, I, I thought you might help her. After all, I'm only a small town practitioner. I'm sure you underrate yourself, doctor. Oh, no. Who did you say the girl's father was? Carruthers. Paul Carruthers. You recall his name appeared in the headlines of the press all over the country a few years ago. He was a scientist who came here to work in peace and secrecy. No one around got to know him. 
His work seemed to consist chiefly of experiments in cell growth stimulation. Now, how he achieved what he did, I don't know. But his work finally appeared in the form of gigantic bats. Several people were killed by the creatures. And then one day, he himself was found dead, killed by one of his own beasts. This is fact, Doctor? Well, the police records have all the details. You mentioned cell growth stimulation. I'd be very interested in seeing his notes and reports. Oh, no chance, Doctor. None were ever found. Mm, very interesting. Somehow or other, the rumor spread that Carruthers was a vampire. So around here, they, they call him the devil bat. Well, I'll be with you in a few minutes, Doctor. With you. Hello, Nina. I'm Dr. Morris. I'm here to do all I can to help you. You've had a bad emotional shock. But that's all over now. There's nothing more to fear. You landed in Quebec. From there, you went to New York, the greatest city in the world. You remember you had difficulty in finding the train that would carry you to the little town of Wardsley. When you stepped off the train, you were happy and filled with expectation. You told the taxi driver to take you to your father's house. He drove you out and left you there and told you that your father was dead. That was a great shock, Nina. You never felt so alone in your life, did you? You went very slowly into that dark, deserted house. You had no idea what you were going to do or to whom you could turn for help. I must congratulate you, Doctor, on recognizing the possibility of a mental shock. You were right. Thank you. I would suggest that you put her up in a hospital for a few days. Give her a nice, cheerful room and plenty of rest. I'll drop by tomorrow and take a look at our patient. I'm sure she'll be all right soon. Bye. Right. wasn't too enthused about living in Westchester County. But now I think you really loved it. It's the home we've always dreamed of, Ted. And I know you'll not be disappointed when you come back. Because I thought of you the first moment I saw it. Lie down. Call Dr. Elliot John right away. Yes, ma'am. She was so cold. My first thought was to get her into bed. Poor child. She was there in the room. I know it. I know it. You're safe here. Just as safe as you can be. Now you relax and go to sleep. Close your eyes. That's right. Now sleep. She seemed to be getting along so splendidly. I've never seen anyone so frightened. It was pitiful. 
Do you think you could get a hold of Dr. Morris in New York? I'd like to talk to him. I can try. Please. Yes, this is Dr. Morris. Oh, hello, Ellen. I was just about to call you. Yes. Nina came to the house. Let me talk to Elliot. Yes, Dr. Elliot. Oh, I don't know of anything else you can do. Rest and quiet will help more than anything else. I'll see you tomorrow. Mrs. Morris insists. Good night, Doctor. Be careful, you'll break it. That Chinese walnut is supposed to have a soothing effect on your nerves. That's why I gave it to you. Don't throw it. Rub it. I'm afraid my problems can't be handled so easily. Can't you try? You were Chinaman guaranteed it. Please, Myra. No whimsy. I'm sorry, Cliff. I didn't realize you were serious. Ellen's little interferences are becoming quite annoying. Really? This call was an example. A hysterical patient runs from the hospital to see me. So Ellen puts her to bed in our guest room. I said I'd throw the socks with Turning our home into a sanatorium? It's her house. She can do as she pleases. Nevertheless, I find it very irritating. That's because you don't belong there. You belong with me. Ellen is honest enough to know, as I know, that you married her for money and position. Why don't you try and use her some of your own advice? Stand on your own feet. Have confidence in your future. We could have a wonderful life together. I'll handle my own affairs, Myra. You're just trying it the wrong way, that's all. Stop it, Myra. If you love me. When I married Ellen, I had good reasons. Important reasons. I won't permit you or anyone to question them. It isn't necessary to question you, Cliff. It's much too obvious. We agreed long ago not to discuss the matter. I want you to ask Ellen for your freedom. I can't. I'm in no position for it, and you know it. I love you, Cliff, but it's come to a point where it's Ellen or me. Myra, you can't. It has to be. You can't do without me any more than I can do without you. We love each other. I'm stronger than you. Or weaker. Because I can't stand it any longer. Myra, we're both a bit nervous, upset. You'll see things differently. Let me hear from you after you have done something about it. Complaining of nerves or empty promises won't be enough anymore. Good night, Cliff. Did Dr. Elliot stay with her? Till the early hours of the morning. I'll take her back to the hospital. I wish you wouldn't. Why not? Well, I'm not a psychiatrist, dear. But it strikes me that Nina is badly in need of a little love and affection. She's so alone and so frightened. What's wrong? Not a thing. I'm always very interested when people are prescribing for my patients. Why, nothing was further from my mind. Oh, Cliff, please. If it's at all possible, let her stay. As you wish, Ellen. Good morning, Nina. I'm very anxious to hear why you ran through the night to see me. All I know is I wanted to see you. I don't remember why. I... I don't remember. You were very frightened. Tell me why. Well... We'll find out. You remember your mother? Oh, yes. 
She was very pretty. Always very kind. And your father? I... He... Nina, your father. There was something about your father. What was it? Other members of your family? Any brothers or sisters? No. What was your father like? You must remember. I don't remember. Were you ever in love, Nina? Not seriously. Uh, where were you during the war? In England, working in a government office. Uh, were you there during the bombings? Yes, but I got through them all right. Bat! Bat! It's not a bat, Nina. It's a bird. My father! Look, Nina. Look. The bird is gone. Sit down, Nina. Now, tell me about it. Why did you think that bird was a bat? And why did you mention your father? You must tell me. Now I remember. Go ahead, Nina. You mustn't be afraid. My father was a Romanian. Came to Scotland, married mother. When I was four, he left us. Soon afterwards, my mother died. Do you remember the circumstances of her death? She died of some sort of an anemia. But people said father killed her. Why did they say that? They believed it. They were always telling stories of demons and vampires and witches who lived in the forest and moors. They said my father was a vampire because he experimented with bats. For a long time, I believed those stories, too. I used to dream of him as a bat. I would be flying beside him. Of course, as I grew older, I realized how childish that was. And what happened when you went into his house? In the laboratory, I, I found an old newspaper saying that, that he was a murderer. Yes? I suddenly felt I wasn't alone anymore. That he was somewhere in the room with me. I even thought I felt him touch my cheek. I ran. That's all I remember. It's all very simple, Nina, now that we have the key. You went through an extremely trying and emotional time during the war. Instinctively, unconsciously, you were looking for help and turned to your father as a last resort only to find that he was dead and a murderer. The newspaper referred to him as a devil bat. That made the conditions exactly the same as at the death of your mother. The child fears of your father returned with a rush. It even blacked out your reason to the extent that you thought he was in the room and that he touched you. He couldn't possibly have been in that laboratory because he's dead. You understand that, don't you? Yes. The dead do not return to us. They cannot influence us in any way. But don't you see how foolish it is to be afraid of something that cannot possibly be true? Dr. Morris, with your help, I'm sure I'll be well again. What is a vampire? I think I can explain that in part, at least. Go ahead, Doctor. According to legend, a vampire is a dead person who is, well, still alive. <laughs> and in order to remain alive after burial, he must drain blood from living persons into his own veins. Oh, that's horrible. And he can be destroyed only by driving a wooden stake through his heart. <laughs> well, then a living person couldn't be a vampire. Oh, no, no. That would be a 
a case of possession. Oh. There, the living person is, or thinks he is, possessed by a vampire, and is thus forced to kill for the vampire. Want coffee, Doctor? No, thank you. I think I'd better be running along. Why, hello there. Good little dog of you. Nobody. That is, he sort of adopted me, didn't you, Joe? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Ted Masters. Mrs. Morris is my mother, and Dr. Morris is my stepfather. Oh, of course. I've seen your picture. I'm Nina McCarran, a patient of Dr. Morris. Oh, you are? Well, it's been a pleasure, Miss McCarran. Come on, Joe. Come on up. Come on up here. Come on up here. Well, I'll see you later. Home. I'm on terminal leave. I'll be out of the army in 30 days. Oh, wonderful. Oh, I, I want you to meet a friend of mine. Come here, Joe. Come on. Oh, I picked him up on Toronto. We've been pals for over a year now. Hello, Joe. Well, hello there. How do you do, sir? You're looking fine. Army life evidently agreed with you. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, by the way, who's the girl in the garden? Don't tell me she came with a house. She's a very sweet girl, but I'll tell you all about her. Didn't you have any luggage or anything? Oh, yes, sir. I, I have a cab waiting. I'll help you. hard for me to believe that there's anything wrong with her. Oh, it's not very serious. Cliff says it's nothing more than a case of nervous fatigue. Don't you worry about it. Do you mind if I worry about you a little bit? Me? For why? Well, I... I noticed your bedroom's on the ground floor. Are you having trouble with your heart again? Oh, I just have to be a little careful. Cliff watches over me. Does he? He's very kind and considerate, Ted. All right. You like him. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Let me guess. Ted. Right. Very nice. Almost as becoming as your uniform. Almost? I got news for you. This is the best uniform in the world. Well, look at that shirt. It won't wear. Isn't that wonderful? And when it's worn out, who's going to stop me from getting a red one with yellow polka dots? Nobody. Oh, you don't like yellow polka dots. Well, would you mind if I just kept it in a drawer and looked at it once in a while? Well, all right. Say, when are you leaving, Ted? Leaving? Well, yes. Don't you remember you said that the first thing you were going to do was buy new clothes? And then you were going on a long fishing trip. Oh, that. Oh, I, I, I can't. Why? Well, I called a fishing hole the other day, and the particular fish I was interested in isn't there anymore. Somebody caught him last year. It's just as well, though. We were getting too friendly anyhow. Oh. Well, don't you know any more fish? Oh, sure. They can wait. <laughs> You're hopeless, Ted. Yeah, I guess so. I'm awfully glad you're staying. So am I.
Morris. Quick. Yes, miss. Nina, come on, sit down. Now tell me about it. It's the tonic. Yes, the tonic. It's half gone. That's right, Nina. But I didn't touch it. Didn't even touch it. When I went to sleep last night, it was full. Somebody drank it. Did you dream last night? It was the same as before. This huge bat appeared at the window and I became part of it. Hmm. The same childhood vampire dream. Only now he's getting worse. He drinks your tonic. Nina, don't you see? You simply don't remember drinking it yourself. But it's happened three times now. Why didn't you tell me? I don't know what I'm going to do with you, Nina. Why do you withhold these things from me? You must tell me everything. I can't cure you if you keep trying remedies of your own on the side. I'm sorry, Doctor. I'm afraid you have no choice, Ellen. Ted must be sent away on one pretext or another. He and Nina seem to be enjoying each other's company so much. Why, I never saw a smile until he came home. Ellen, that is precisely the reason. Can't you see they're falling in love? But of course, Cliff, but why not? Do you know what you're saying? How can you be so quick to throw away your son's happiness? And for a girl you don't even know yet. Oh, that isn't true. I do know, Nina. Then perhaps you'd better take over her case. For I admit very frankly, I don't know her. Oh, please, Cliff, don't. I only meant an intuitive feeling. Then I advise you not to trust it. All right, Cliff, I'll do as you say. I know Ted is planning on joining a law office in Boston. I'll try and hurry him. You'll be glad later, dear. Perhaps you're right. I'm leaving for Boston tomorrow, but I'll be down every weekend. That is, for a while, anyway. After all, I'll expect my wife to live there. She'll marry me. You shouldn't ask that, Ted. You don't know enough about me. You haven't known me long enough. I'm not well. I know all about you. Mother told me. It doesn't make the slightest difference. I love you, Nina. Will you marry me? Oh, Ted. Don't leave it in here, please. I'm making this experiment so that you can't drink it without awakening yourself. That should convince you. Please, please stay with me. To conquer your fears, you must face them squarely, alone. Here, you'd better take two of these tonight. Come on, Joe. Nina has to go to bed. Won't you let him stay with me? Ted said he could. All right, Nina.
Anything wrong? He's dead. His soul has been pierced. How did this happen? Let me see your hands. Why did you kill him? Why? I don't know. Last night there was a pet at the window trying to get in. I heard my father's voice calling. That's nonsense, Nina, and you know it. Father's command. She imagined she heard his voice. But he is the shadowy something that's been living in the room with her. The vampire fixation is now complete. She believes her father can possess her at will, and that she must obey him. And there's nothing you can do for her? Certainly, Ellen, but the mind is a peculiar and complex thing. Progress is slow, cannot be hurried. At this point, she's dangerous. I can't allow her to stay here any longer. I know a private sanatorium in New York where she can be cared for properly. I'll take her there tomorrow. Nina. Nina, dear. What's to become of me? I wish I were dead. Oh, you mustn't blame yourself. Why, you meant no harm. Oh, it's such a beautiful day. We'll have breakfast on the terrace together. Then we'll find lots of things to take our mind off it. Oh! I didn't think there was anyone as good as you in the whole world. Don't cry, <laughs> Don't cry. <laughs> to go to bed. I was in bed. I couldn't sleep. You get right over there and try again. No wonder you couldn't sleep. Why did you take this from my desk? Well, you were reading it. I thought that... Uh... I have forbidden you to read anything but what I prescribe. You're going to have to make up your mind to obey me, Nina. Yes, Doctor. of them. Here, take these.
I can't tell you how sorry I am. Thank you, sir. I'm just waiting to see Dr. Morris. He'll be glad you're back. He's taking it very hard. Where's Nina? In the county hospital. Thank you, doctor. You may stay 15 minutes. Why did you come? Tell me you didn't do it, Nina. You couldn't have. It's true, Ted. I loved your mother as much as if, as if she were my own. And I killed her. I won't believe it. I, I simply can't. I even killed your little dog. Oh, Nina. Don't touch me. Six days until the trial. Six days to prove she didn't do this thing. I don't know much about the workings of the mind, Doctor. Tell me, is it possible for a person to commit a crime in their sleep? Well, medical men have reported such cases, yes. But only where the criminal impulse is present. That couldn't be the case with Nina. I don't know. You're liable to run into a little prejudice there. You see, the prosecution will undoubtedly claim that she has inherited tendencies from her father based on the fact that three murders were charged to him through the bats he developed. Well, did he ever confess? No, he was dead when they found him. Killed by one of his own beasts. Is anyone carrying on his experiments? No, no notes or reports were ever found. No papers of any kind. So whatever he knew about cell growth stimulation died with him. You know the old Carruthers house, don't you, Doctor? Yes, been there several times. Well, let's go over there now. I'd like to see the place. Well, it's on my way home. All right. Come along. Obviously, for Carruthers papers. Perhaps. Well. Ted. Yeah? Come here. Help me move this shelf. observation since the moment she was found on the road. I don't get it, Doctor. Who would be interested in learning the secret of enlarging bats? Who? Well, to speak for myself, Ted, I'd be very interested. Any man with a scientific turn of mind would be. Scientific mind, huh? Mm-hmm. Doctor, what would you say if I told you my stepfather, Cliff Morris, has those papers? I wouldn't believe it. If Morris had discovered the papers, he'd have handed them over to the authorities. Why? You dislike him very much, don't you, Ted? Yes, that's putting it mildly. Well, that doesn't give you the right to accuse him. He's a very respected man, Ted, and you should be careful of your words. At any rate, we must report our findings to the sheriff. Oh, doctor. Would you mind waiting a few days? Why? Well, I'd sort of like to try and find Carruthers' papers myself. 
All right, Dad. Downstairs, sir. Well, uh, tell him I'll be right there. Yes, sir. Well, I really didn't expect you to find him. After all, Ted, you must admit, it was a wild assumption. He must have them someplace. I've torn the house apart from attic to cellar, and I can't find them anywhere. Just one more place. Mr. Masters and Dr. Elliott in the garden. Thank you, John. Hello, Dr. Elliott. Hello, Ted. Hello, Cliff. Hello, Doctor. Glad to see you. You're looking a little better today. I don't feel it. I can't get it out of my mind, this horrifying act of a patient. I blame myself. Now, you're the psychiatrist. And I must remind you that such thoughts are dangerous. The unpredictable behavior of a patient can't be held against you. The first mistake cost Ellen her life. Doctor, you've no right going to your office these days. It's not fair to your patients or yourself. It'd be much wiser to go away for a while. What an idea, Elliot. I wouldn't think of it. My testimony will be very important to Nina. And after the trial, we'll have to see to it that everything possible is done. You, you never, never committed this crime. I committed the perfect crime. 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 Did I say something? Yes. You just asked if there's such a thing as the perfect crime. I did. Oh, I, I wondered if... Why? I don't know. I must have been debating something I read or heard. I'm inclined to say the perfect crime is possible. There's no such thing as a perfect crime, Doctor. There's only imperfect investigation which allows the criminal to get away with it. I agree. The criminal's bound to make at least one mistake. Leave one clue. Then Tui lives under a terrific mental strain day and night. He can't sleep or eat normally. Unless he's a superman, he's bound to crack up one day. You know, I can imagine... Imagine Ed. Would you mind developing your theories by yourself? I'd like Dr. Elliot to discuss the medical issues in Nina's case. Not at all, Cliff. You gonna use a car today? No. Take it if you wish. Well, I thought I'd go into New York and see a show or something. It's a good idea. Goodbye, Doc. See you later, Cliff. So long, son. You shouldn't come here, Ted. But it's important, Nina. I have to know something. Did Dr. Morris ever talk to you about your father's papers or notes? Did he ever show you any? No. Please, Ted, I don't want to hear anything about my father. Oh, what is this? <laughs> Long-distance operator, please. Yes, please. Wardsley, 8444. Yes. Riverdale, 3968. Yes, please. Hello, Dr. Morris. Good evening, sir. This is George. 
Yes, the manager of your apartment. Yes, sir. Well, there's a young man here who says he's your stepson. Wants to spend the night in your apartment. Because the hotels are crowded, he couldn't get a room. No, he can't drive home. Well, no, I don't think you can talk to him. Uh, to be frank, well, sir, the young man is out like a light. He's fallen asleep in my office. He said he met an old pal of his and they had a couple of drinks. <laughs> yes, I'll take good care of him. I just wanted to make sure, sir. All right, good night. I will go in the bedroom and you'll get a good night. No, sir. I'll sleep right here. Don't you want to take a shower? Or? This is good enough for All me. All right. I'll just lie right down here. Uh, you want me to get you a nice blanket? No, no. Good night, Jack. This is fine. All Thank right. you very much. Good night. your mind, Ted. Mother's been dead for only two weeks. And already you and Cliff have planned an elopement. I'm not surprised at him. But you, Myra, one of Mother's closest friends. Here's a drink, Ted. I don't know anything about an elopement. But Cliff had everything arranged. He didn't ask me. Then he seems to... Expect your complete obedience. What are you here as, Ted? An inquisitor? To judge me? What is there between you and Cliff, Myra? I'm in love with Cliff. And he's in love with me. We've been in love for a long time. Since I first came to this country. We were secretly engaged. Then he met your mother. I myself introduced them. Three months later, Cliff broke our engagement and married your mother. He tried to tell me that it would make no difference between us. 
I pleaded with him to ask your mother for a divorce. He refused. Of course, he would. I've always thought he married mother for her money. I guess that's it. I'm sorry, Myra. And then came this horrible thing. Her murder by this crazy girl. I haven't seen him since. I couldn't. But you love him. Yes. Will you marry him? I guess so. I guess I will. Would you if you knew that he killed Mother? That same thought has occurred to you. Is that true, Myra? You have thought about it, haven't you? What proof is there? I'm groping in the dark. There's no obvious clue. But I'm sure Nina's innocent. Not only because I love her, but... There's just one small hope. What is it, Ted? The papers left by Nina's father seem to be of great importance. They remained hidden for many years, and somebody found them. I'm sure it was Cliff. I've searched every corner of the house and Cliff's apartment, but I can't find them anywhere. Search my apartment, too, Ted. I didn't come to ask that, Myra. He often left. Things here I always thought as a reminder. Thanks. Thank you, John. <coughs> Anything else? It's 10 o'clock, sir. All right. You and your wife may go. Thank you, sir, and good night. It all sounds plausible, but it seems so incredible, Ted. If he should be innocent. Then I'll have a lot of explaining to do. But if he isn't, you'll have to come out fighting tonight. I'm so afraid. We have to find out. Yes. Good night, Myra. And thanks again. Good night, Ted. Be careful. Don't worry. I will. you get here? I drove, but only a few hours ago you were helplessly drunk. I found something that sobered me up in a hurry. So you found it in my apartment. May I have it? Not right now. So uh, did I ever tell you its history? Oriental philosophers used to rub them in their hands as they paced the Great Wall of China, meditating. They were considered symbols of learning, were handed down from father to son. After many generations, they become highly prized heirlooms. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, you still seem a bit under the weather. Perhaps you'd better go to bed. Turning in won't help. I didn't find your precious walnut in your apartment. It was on the floor of Carruthers Laboratory. That possibility occurred to me today. Then you admit having found his papers. I looked for them, but 
Unfortunately, no. I felt something was on your mind. But why this sudden interest in Carruthers' notes? That is, granting he left any. I think they might prove that you killed my mother. I thought I knew how much you hated me, Ted. But I see I underestimated. I can only hope that you'll keep this fantastic notion to yourself. There's nothing fantastic about it. You're in love with someone else. But you wanted more than your freedom. You wanted the money you would inherit from my mother. Once and for all, Ted, I want you to know that I loved your mother dearly. following me. I won't fight you. I've been to Myra's. She told me the whole filthy story. And I found Carruthers' papers. Well, now perhaps you'll tell me their great significance. They proved that Carruthers was not a murderer. If you'd let Nina read the truth about her father, she would have been cured. Come in, gentlemen. I've been expecting you. Evening, Doctor. Hello, Morris. Evening, gentlemen. Perhaps we'd better go in here. Dr. Morris, can you spare a moment? Certainly. Go ahead, Sheriff. Dr. Morris, did you take these papers from the Carruthers' house? Yes. Why didn't you bring them to me? Because it didn't fit in with his plan to murder my mother. Ted, you're insane. Dr. Elliott and I read these, but I don't see how... Then please listen. It isn't complicated. He had to have someone to put the blame on. Nina. Any jury would be quick to condemn her on the basis of inherited criminal tendencies. He couldn't give up those papers because they proved that her father was not a murderer. Calling him devil, bat, and vampire was throwing mud at a great scientist. He was far ahead of even today's experiments in cell growth stimulation and proved it on plants and frogs and bats. It was a world's loss when his bats broke loose and killed some people. Because they killed him, too. Dr. Elliott will tell you that supposed inherited criminal tendencies is only one of hundreds of causes of mental aberrations. In Nina's case, I chose to consider it a persecution complex. In my opinion, Ted, Dr. Morris handled her case very competently. I would still like to know why these papers weren't handed over to the authorities. Well, frankly, gentlemen, they were of so little interest I forgot them at a friend's apartment and didn't bother to return for them. That's a lie. Myra Arnold will testify that you studied Carruthers' notes carefully and were enthused about their commercial possibilities. If I said anything of the kind to Miss Arnold, it was in a kidding vein. I don't consider myself on trial here, but I would appreciate it if you would tell this young lawyer just how much of a case he has. Beyond the illegal possession of these papers, which you admit, I'd say none. I know you killed my dog and pulled that trick with a tonic just to force Nina into the state of mind where she believed she did it. Are you sure, Ted, you aren't letting personal feelings run away with you? I think you are, young man. Well, gentlemen, this has been a bit nerve-wracking. If you don't mind, I'll retire. If there are any charges to be preferred against me concerning these papers, you'll find me at my New York apartment after tomorrow. I wouldn't worry about it. Well, if that's all, we'll be leaving. It isn't. Just a moment. What's that? It's a sodium derivative. I had it analyzed at a medical laboratory this afternoon. And what do you hope to prove with it? that besides driving Nina deeper and deeper into her fears by suggestion, you drugged her with these night after night. What do they do? They're the most powerful dream stimulant known. And frequently used by modern psychiatrists. Then you admit giving them to her? Most certainly. 
Who was in the house the night of the murder? I'll tell you. Just you and Nina. The servants were in their quarters over the garage. So? Anyone under the influence of that drug is incapable of movement. Someone had to carry Nina down those stairs and place her in front of that bedroom door. That someone was you, Cliff, after you murdered Mother. <laughs> understand, darling. He made you think all those things. He wanted to frighten and terrify you. He made you believe them so he could use you to cover up for his crime. You see, there's nothing to be afraid of anymore. And I was so sure. Will I ever really believe in myself again? What does it matter? As long as you believe in me. You're right. It doesn't matter at all. Thanks for watching the Baba ba Ghoulie Show by OTR Halloween Holidays. This is Waddle the Duck saying check out Channel Watch Waddle for some fun cartoons with no static. <laughs>